Hello, 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 and welcome to Straight No Chaser with Dr. Julius Bailey. As you know by now, I am Dr. Bailey, and this show is live from the vibrant campus of Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio, where as of right now, the campus is being populated uh, daily with masked young adults pushing through the pandemic in search of community identity, and I think a little bit of hope. We you know with a little bit of education on top, I guess. Uh, this would be a challenge for us, as it is for all campuses across the nation, uh, with I mean, sort of what is the right decision to make when it comes to this education and starting schools and that kind of thing of this next generation? I don't know. I mean, what is the proper call when it comes to parents and child care and it comes to, you know, the K through 12, you know, nationally? What about us as a, as a college campuses? Um, what about us as professors? What about teachers from K through 12? Many of us will, will, will be risking our health to sort of meet the needs of our profession. It's a tough call for everybody, family. And so I know those of you who are listening are, are, are wrestling through this reality. But if this is your first time here at Straight No Chaser, then get your drink together. I know it's early, so get your orange juice. Even we aren't drinking this morning. It's a little too early. Uh, we got Coca-Cola today, I promise you. That's what we got. Uh, uh, get comfortable and prepare for one of the most powerful shows to date. Uh, I am a professor of philosophy and African American studies here at Wittenberg. I direct our pre-law program and uh, the Justice Law and Public Policy uh, Department. I am the author of five academic books and one memoir. And my current book, uh, Racism, Hypocrisy, and Bad Faith, A Moral Challenge to the America That I Love, will be discussed a little bit today. And so um, you all know my co-host, Ms. Tisa. You remember Ms. Tisa in the fall? We uh, had a conversation with uh, in, in our beloved community yeah, we did. Uh, group with one of Eddie Glaude's books, uh, uh, "In Democracy in Black." Right? right. You remember that? I do remember that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know that, uh, as Jay Z says, he packs heat like the oven does. Oh snap! <laughs> <laughs> If you can't take the heat, get your out the kitchen. That's what they say. That's, That's what, they what they say. say. So what are you going to be doing today? So today I am going to be behind the scenes. Good morning, Straight No Chaser audience. We have, of course, Dr. Bailey and Dr. Excuse me, um, Eddie Claude with us this morning. Um, Dr. Bailey will be gifting the audience four books. So two of, of his and two of Dr. Eddie Glaude's. You have from now until 12 in order to uh, have a chance to be gifted one of those books. Once again, we'll do it like we did last time, Straight No Chaser audience. Like, share, and subscribe. Like and share on Facebook. Subscribe on YouTube to Dr. Julius Bailey's YouTube channel, and you will have a chance to win one of the four books. Make sure you type in done at the conclusion so that we know that you did what needed to be done. That's cool. That's cool. Well, we'll see you in about 30 minutes. Then. Sounds like a plan. All right. All right. All right. Um, so welcome again, everybody. Again, we um, are uh, excited to be able to um, have this show today. We're just going to jump right into it. The, 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 the distinguished professor uh, 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 at um, Princeton University and chair of Afro-American Studies. Uh, you all have seen him, um, obviously, on MSNBC. He is the author of, I don't know, what, eight, nine books. Um, I mean, you know, people are authors and then there's an author, right? Uh, so he's a, he, he puts together masterpieces. Uh, and so we're just excited to have Dr. Eddie Claude with us. Sir, how are you today? I'm doing well. This is a delight and a pleasure to join you to be able to participate in Straight No Chase of this conversation, Doc. How you holding Man, up? Man, look, it is an honor to put eyes on you again, brother. It's, it's been too long. It's, it's been, been much long. too long. And, um, you know, the reality is, is that I often tell the story uh, that I applied to Princeton for grad school. Uh, and, and Dr. West called and told me he was leaving Princeton for Harvard, right? And he said, <laughs> And then I was like, well, what am I supposed to do now? You know what I'm saying? And I took a year off. I was able to teach uh, at Howard. 
Uh, and then I arrived to Cambridge, sort of scared out of my mind, bro. I mean, and 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 all I would hear, quite frankly, was the academic lore of Eddie Glaude. You know what I'm saying? And you were at Bowdoin, I think, at the time. And then right. uh, uh, and then, and then one day I was sitting in uh, FM Studies office, um, and here you come in for a visit. And you know, and quite frankly, I ain't gonna lie, man. I was like, there he is. You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> there he is, like. And you were gracious to me. I was a 24-year-old kind of wide-eyed, you know, graduate student who saw you as a big brother that, uh, you know, our, our our common academic dad bragged about all the time. And so it was rough, man. And to look at you now and to look at what we all are doing, man, it is just such, I mean, you represent such an exemplar of, of love, of care, uh, sort of a sort of intellectual viscosity, if you will, that serves the standard for us as Christian philosophers out here, man. So thank you so much. I that, that appreciate that. I, you, I remember us precepting you, 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 I precepted and you TA'd uh, for that introduction to African-American cultural practices course. And so uh, all of us who uh, are, are Cornell's students, at least at some point in time, had to DJ as right. did that music lecture, you know. That music lecture. <laughs> <laughs> and ended with the caravan of love, you know. For this, sure, this is, for this is sure. part of this. We're part of a grand tradition, and you know, we always want to lift up the brilliance of, of our of our teacher, of our mentor, uh, Dr. West, as he's out here continuing to fight the good fight. No question, man. No question. So obviously, we're going to dive deep into your brilliant uh, text, and um, but but before we get too deep, let me ask you, man. I, I mean, how, how did a brother like you go from Moss Point, Mississippi, to the chair of Princeton University African American Studies? But by the grace, no, um, it is uh, it is it is a journey that is full of of, of just extraordinary experiences, uh, people who have loved me to death, and of course, uh, you know, good fortune and discipline, uh, and and having a sense of vocation. So, what does it mean to to be able to grow up in a working class community where there weren't very many books, uh, you know, to be honest with you. Uh, but I was a precocious kid and I had parents who understood that uh, to make my way to Morehouse uh, and to be affirmed uh, in some ways to have the seed planted that if we're going to do this work, we need to do it on behalf of justice and on behalf of the people you care most about. And, you know, making my way from Morehouse to Temple and then, you know, Bumping into Dr. West at bumping into Cornell at uh, the University of Wisconsin Madison Conference at African American mm. Studies, uh, mm. where Skip Gates and Malefia Sante, I was at Temple at the time working on a PhD in African American Studies at Temple, um, and because I started college so early, I was really young, and so so I gave this this graduate student paper, and Cornell was right there in the audience, and. Uh, after I gave the paper, it was it I was I was disenchanted with African American with Afrocentrism and African American studies at Temple, so I read it. I gave a paper reading Afrocentrism as a species of idealism, mm. and suffering some of the same, you know, problems that idealism faced. Uh, and Cornell was there, and he heard this. He said, "Who is this brother?" And we struck up a conversation. I happened. He invited me to attend. This is called the Good Fortune. He invited me to attend the first ever graduate seminar in African American studies taught at Princeton. He co-taught it with Nell Painter. Mm. I came. I was driving back and forth to Philly uh, to attend that seminar, and then a few years later, about a decade later, Cornell and I were te teaching that same seminar at Princeton. It was it's yes. something else, brother. It was something else. Yeah. Now that's a powerful story, man. I I know. I mean, I, I I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that that you said Morehouse like five times and um, <laughs> as, as a Howard man, you know, I got to respect the house though. So I, I respect Morehouse, but the deck is still strong, you know. <laughs> you knew I was going to do it. So, you yeah, I mean, you said it three, four times. I'm like, I know, brother, I know. <laughs> you know, I had but to. No, nah, man. Uh, so as you know, you know, you uh, uh, graced um, a sort of a pre-copy of the book and you read through it a little bit. And, and as you know, I subtitled my this book, the Racism, Hypocrisy, and Bad Faith book. I subtitled it um, sort of a, a moral uh, sort of challenge to the America 
that I love. And what I was trying to get across or come to grips with, I'd say, is kind of like through the, the old BG's question, you know, how deep is my love for this country, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, while recognizing the sort of constant hell that the ontology of blackness faces, right? Mm. And sort of what does it mean to sort of love in a nation uh, uh, that is so fundamentally broken? And, uh, and, and so this is kind of uh, uh, what you do also uh, with your Begin Again text. So tell us, you know, let's kind of jump right into it. Uh, how do you personally and James Baldwin wrestle with this sort of uh, the ontology of blackness in America? Right. So, I mean, you know, I've been walking with Baldwin for about um, 30 years and he has he has informed and shaped my scholarly career since graduate school. Um, trying in some ways to figure out how uh, Baldwin's understanding of democracy and understanding of race shape how I think and how I interpret American pragmatism, for example. Um, and so there's a sense in which Baldwin's, you know, to answer your question directly, Baldwin's revolutionary inversion is at the heart of, of, of how I think about matters. And that is he insists that we must understand that the problem is not us. Mm. Mm -hmm. That when we think about uh, this ontology of blackness, right, uh, we have to unpack, right, the ways in which uh, blackness is rendered in this place, how white supremacy distorts and disfigures uh, our characters, because it's rooted in this belief that white people matter more than others. And then that belief, as I argued in Democracy and Black, shapes our dispositions and forms our practices right, gives content to our social, political, and economic arrangements, and then we build a scaffolding of lies around those practices to, to protect the, the innocence of, of our self-conception, right, to, to allow us to, to live in this moment of, uh, or in this space of, of, of self, of the self-deception. And this is where our two books intersect in so many ways, because the value gap and the scaffolding of lies require in some ways uh, hypocrisy and bad faith at its core, right? Mm -hmm. And then if hypocrisy and bad faith are constitutive elements of the polity, then one has to ask the question, what happens to deliberative democracy in that context, you see? Right. And so right. this is where, where your book kind of comes directly in. So, so, the, so the move about that Baldwin makes initially, that the problem isn't us, that what we have to do is engage in this ongoing work to keep the detritus, the nonsense of what the world says about us from taking root in us. In us, yeah. And that becomes what he calls the Negro problem in the uses of the blues, that we have to try to prevent our children from believing what the world says about them. And then as he says in that wonderful moment, let's give this N word back to them. Why did you create it? Why did you need it? In fact, we need to ask the question, who's really the N-word baby, as Baldwin would say. And Ooh. so that shift is at the heart of, I think, his aesthetics, is at the heart of his politics. Um, and, it, and, it, and, it, and he's thinking about it, Julius, in, in the context of different material conditions. Mm -hmm. So it's the same theme running throughout the corpus but he's thinking about it under different material conditions. So what does it mean to think about that claim in 1955, in 1963, in 1972, in 1982, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's gonna look differently under these under these different conditions. That's a long-winded answer, but I think you get the point. No, 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 no. That's rich, that's rich. Uh, uh, and, you, know, you know, so I come to Baldwin, um, I came to Baldwin, as a student, um, as an undergrad. And of course I was reading the fire next time, right? And so um, one of uh, my favorite quotes uh, of Baldwin in that book, he says something like, um, you know, and it, it so, so we we ought to rejoice in the fact of death. Right, right? yes. We I'm ought to earn, right? He says we, we need to earn one's death by confronting the passion of the conundrum of life. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and so and, and so he 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 he's he's sort of articulating that life is as he says a small beacon right in the darkness from which we 
uh, comment from which we shall return. And so, you know, I always, I always go to that quote when I think about, you know, of course, you know, me and Doc argued last week about Camus, right? And so <laughs> we talked, we argued a little bit about it, but we know that Baldwin sort of wrestled with life, right? Yeah. And he wrestled with the living, right? Living in life, right? Uh, you talk about here, and I know, you know, those of us in the audience who read Baldwin, we know that he's wrestled with some suicidal ideations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, can, can you talk a little bit about his wrestling of life and his wrestling of living? Yeah, you know, I mean, part of, I mean, Baldwin believes wholeheartedly in the Socratic dictum that the unexamined life is not worth living. And it, it translates in this way, Brother Julius, that uh, in order to say anything about the world and the messiness of the world, one has to deal with the messiness of one's own interior life, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's this sense in which Baldwin is trying to grapple with, right, his own formation, right? Uh, what does it mean to grow? You know, he doesn't grow up in Sugar Hill. Baldwin comes out of the hood, mm -hmm. right? He's educated in the alleys of, of, of Harlem and, 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 and Greenwich Village and Paris, right? He's not a Morehouse man. He's not a Howard Bison, right? He's not... You know, he's not, you know, uh, a college graduate. He doesn't go to Tuskegee like Ralph Ellison, right? So there's a sense in which Baldwin is grappling with what does it mean to engage in this arduous task of self-creation under captive conditions, under the mm -hmm. conditions of the absurd? What does it mean to try to will oneself into a certain form of living, right? right? When what has been deposited in your gut is a kind of self-loathing. How does one work through that sense of self-loathing in public, on the page, on the page yeah. and, in, and come out of it in some significant way as the artist that you imagined yourself? Because you know Baldwin leaves the, the United States in 1948 because he knows if he stays, he's either gonna kill somebody or somebody gonna kill him. Kill him. Yeah. But he also says, and nobody knows my name, that when he left, he realized that he did not leave behind what the mess that the country had deposited in him. So he still had to grapple with this sense of not only a country that says, because you're black, because you're poor, because you uh, 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 are queer or gay, however we want to use, whatever word we want to use, because your sexuality is not uh, uh, doesn't fit with the heteronormative assumptions about who we ought to love and who we ought to desire, that somehow you are then an object of disdain. Mm. And then you have to deal with that on top of the fact that he grew up in an environment where his stepfather told him that he was so ugly that nobody could love him. Mm. That he was the object of, shall we say, unloving touch. Not just simply the object of racism. I mean, when you read Baldwin's corpus, you see clearly that he was subject to kind of sexual predatory behavior, that he was in some way he had to bear the brunt right, of a certain kind of violence, right? And then the fact that he said, he came to, as one point, he says in The Price of the Ticket, right? Uh, he says um, uh, uh, in that introduction, he says that he had hurt a many a person because he didn't believe someone as ugly as him could be loved. Right. right. And so what we see in 55, relationship collapses, Baldwin, takes a whole bunch of pills, realizes that he's about to kill himself, calls his friend Mary, she rushes over and they save his life. Or after King's assassinated and another relationship collapses, he attempts suicide in 1969, right? Baldwin um, um, understood the depths of, of, of the difficulty of what it, mean, what it means to try to forge an authentic way of being in the world that you have to work through your own pain, right? Your own sense of fragility, your own vulnerability, uh, your own fragileness. Um, and sometimes you might not make it when you deal with that. When you deal with that. Wow. Wow. So let's, let's kind of take a gentle shift. Um, you know, being at, you know, being at Howard in the nineties, you know, I was influenced a lot by, you know, now Mayor Raz Baraka, um, uh, Malik Shabazz, Jelani Cobb, you know, yeah. these sort of, you know, Nico. nationalists, quite frankly, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And others like that. And I was almost convinced that a multiracial democracy was sort of my own pipe dream. 
right? I mean, I was living like, you know, I, I just thought that I was sitting there trying to be this sort of Christian, bringing everybody among love, that we can hope in the best of people and all that kind of stuff. But then, you know, like I said, those influences made me really second guess whether or not America can push through, right? The Pan-African, you know, the Pan-Africanist movement, the sort of Afrocentrism of Malefia Sante you mentioned earlier, and mm -hmm. all this sort of making me think maybe not. But then I got up there to Cambridge and then through, through the lineage of you and David Kim and, you know, Andre and Trisha and, and Brother Jonathan and all y'all taught me that we need solidarity, right? Mm -hmm. That a sort of work of, a, a sort of a, a coalition building a folk willing to sort of grapple at the ideological level and at the street level, right, with poverty and race and and, and sort of what our, our our mentor would call the imperial sort of ethos of America, or as you say, the lie. Mm. And, and that lie now is being grappled with, right, as young people are tearing down monuments, right, yeah. as they're really trying to push the streets uh, as as we speak. And so I think now, brother, more than ever. We have sort of in the in, in George Floyd's public lynching, sort of we have to tap into multiracial coalitions. Like my, my my challenge to you, or my question to you really is, is that how broad then should that battleground be? Right? I mean, what should this moment call for with regard to the streets and those of us who are working intellectually with young folk in the streets, right? I mean, what should the battleground should it simply be about? you know, a police brutality that we've been dealing with all these years, or should it be something a little bit broader? Well, you know, I mean, I think we can use the question of, of, of policing in this country, the issue of public safety in this country as a kind of synecdoche, as a part for the whole, mm -hmm. right? So when, when we hear the phrase, for example, defund the police, uh, uh, you know, some, some people will, will engage in bad faith around their misunderstanding of what that phrase means. Um, and say it means you know abolishing the police and, uh, in some crude, crass sense, when in fact it's all about uh, how our budgets reflect what we value. And when you think about defunding the police as as a kind of catchphrase, right? It's a point of entry to a broader discussion about a public infrastructure of care. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to think about safety? Uh, in the context of a, of, a, of a broader understanding, a more robust understanding of the public good, right? So when we, so, so part of what I think is, is really important is that we understand these moment, this moment as a point of entry to a broad re-envisioning of the country. For the last 40, 50 years, we've been playing on, on the field of Ronald Reagan yeah. and the yeah. assumptions of Reaganism. And the assumption of Reaganism or Thatcherism or neoliberalism, however we wanna describe it, right, eviscerates any idea of the public good. Uh, it reduces us to actors who are in pursuit of self-interest and competition and rivalry with others. With others, yeah. It, 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 it destroys kind of any kind of infrastructure that of care uh, because we've all re been reduced to competitors. It exploits grievance, resentment, and hatred in the name of a kind of unspoken whiteness that's moving us about so part of what we have to do is dismantle that ideological frame. And we have to come at it, not just, you know, it's, you can't just, it's, it's, you know, we both read our William James and we both, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, understand that, you know, you just can't take the whole thing and just throw it out, right? Oh, yeah. you, you're really um, adjusting and moving and moving pieces and parts that could then lead to its collapse. So, you know, and like you, you know, when I was at Morehouse, Julius, you know, I cut my political teeth in the black nationalist tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I, you know, I remember reading, you know, I, I remember reading the, the, um, the autobiography of Malcolm X when I got to Morehouse and having my second conversion, ex having a conversion experience. And my goatee is to this day, a testament to that experience, right? I took Shahada under H. Rap Brown, right? Cause I was trying to relive Malcolm's life. I, was one of the founding members of Kemet, an Afrocentric fraternity at Morehouse, right? Okay. We started OAC, Organization of African American Consciousness, a reading group around this stuff. I was following Khaled around, right? So there's this sense, there was a reason why I landed at Temple, right? 
And there was a reason why I think at the end of the day, when I encountered uh, the bibliography that Cornell represents in so many ways and the thinking and spirit that he represents, that um, uh, I began to see that a certain understanding of the world had me locked permanently in the dock of the station because I was in some ways preoccupied with white folk, even though I was saying I was a black nationalist. Right, right. I was still stuck uh, in some ways. And so it's, I think, what I've learned from Baldwin, and I'll come to, I'll, I'll bring this, try to tie a bow around this point. Mm -hmm. Baldwin enabled me to be rageful and to be loving at the same time. Mm -hmm. And he says at the end of the fire next time, and he says at the end of No Name in the Street, as he says at the end of his life, those relatively few of that relatively few of us, those con those relatively conscious few, who must like lovers join together, right, right, and try to build this new Jerusalem. I'm bringing them all together now. All these various points, right? right? That's not reducible to to the idolatry of race. That's bound up with the with an idea uh, that we're all every human personality is sacred, and that we should build a world to reflect that. Sure, sure. So you make a point about the idea of the third awakening or founding uh, um, yeah. of America. Can, can, can you give us a quick understanding of what sure. that means? Sure. You know, the second founding, of course, happened in the context of the Civil War and radical reconstruction. And there we got the modern U.S. nation state, a notion of citizenship untethered from race. We got the passage of the Civil War amendments, 13, 14, 15th amendments. Right. We get a particular understanding of taxation. We get in other words, we get the modern U.S. nation state in that moment. The country doubled down. on What was the response? It doubled down on ugliness in response to this reimagining. Well, how so? Jim Crow in in the South. We get, um, uh, you know, you could we also all read C. Van Woodward's uh, text, the you know John Hope Franklin's work. We get, you know, the passage of the you know, the implementation of racial apartheid in the South. We also get convict leasing as a response to that. Cities like Birmingham were built as a result of the conscription of black labor and forced uh, 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 to earlier deaths as they as they built places like Birmingham and the like. But also we get the ideology of Anglo-Saxonism, which of course is an ideology that drives America's imperial ambition. At the very moment in which Jim Crow is being consolidated in the South, America's annexing millions of people of color and exporting right, its ideology of white supremacy. So the first found, the second founding right, was compromised by the ideology of white supremacy, or by this belief that white people matter more than others. Uh, so I'm saying we need a third founding a third founding that involves uh, imagining this democracy, Julius, uh, without the undertow of the value gap. Mm. Um, and, and, and what would that mean? That means that first we have to tell the truth about what we've done, that telling the truth would then set the conditions for reconciliation. And then we have to go about passing policies, implementing policies that will repair uh, what we have done and set the stage for a new iteration of the country. It's one thing to recognize Confederate monuments as monuments to an ideology of white supremacy. It's right. easy to snatch down a Robert E. Lee statue, but it's not so easy to snatch down Chicago's uh, highways. Right. Those are monuments right. too. The right. zoning of, of LA, the zoning of New York, those are yeah. monuments too. So the built environment actually reflects an ideology that we have to repair as well. Ooh, ooh. now nah, that's, that's rich, man. That's really rich. Um, so you had made reference real uh, earlier also about um, Baldwin's going to Paris. I know uh, you talk, you know, in the opening of the book about you began writing this book in Germany. Um, yeah. And we know, obviously, uh, what Giovanni's Room, I think, was written in Paris. Right. Yeah. Uh, as well as uh, what, what Gotel on the Mountain. Right. Right. Um, so he left. Right. And returned again and left and returned again. And then you know, he ended up died right, and dying in France, right? So these exilic moments, if you will, uh, were channeled, right, by a need for perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that's what you uh, kind of did in your writing of Baldwin. So was it, do you think this was a conciliatory move to America? As you think about the third, you know, this sort of third awakening, uh, or when you went to go to Germany, were you thinking that you needed to get away because of, of, of that perspective? 
or or are you almost like Baldwin that you know look I'm almost at the point where I can't take this no more. Well, you know, I, I'm first of all, I'm blessed to be able to travel. Some right. people can't get away from this place, but I understood right. when I set out to write the book that Baldwin insisted that you had to get some critical distance to use Michael Walzer's language, some critical distance in order to say something critical about the country. Um, so Baldwin, my initial idea was to, to I was on sabbatical. I was going to rent a, uh, an apartment in St. Thomas. I had rented an apartment in St. Thomas. It was there that I finished An Uncommon Faith. Um, and I was starting to begin the writing uh, um, um, or at least the thinking about Begin Again, and then Hurricane Maria came. Mm -hmm. And then I had, I got an invitation to go to Heidelberg, and there, as soon as I wasn't in Heidelberg for an hour as I write about it, and four white police officers had their, had their knee in the back of a black man who was screaming at the top of his lungs. And I was struggling with the angle of the book at, up until that point, because you know I had mm -hmm. thought I was going to write an intellectual biography, and I, the the archive wasn't giving me what I thought it was going to give me. And once I saw that, I ran back to my apartment, and I just started writing furiously. And the book came to me in how it organized itself. And much of that writing showed up in the introduction. Mm -hmm. So I needed the distance. Because the one thing I didn't have to do after I saw what the police was doing, I didn't have to go on television and run my mouth about it. <laughs> I didn't have to come home and look at my son and worry about him. Right. I didn't have to deal with the stressors right. of this public consumption of the pornography of black grief and suffering and death mm. that 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 constitutes what it means to be in this place. Right? So I had the space to begin to just breathe and think. Now, part of what I argue in the book is that all, all of us can't obviously leave the country, but we can all find our elsewhere. Right. But we can get right. that distance so that we right. can figure out how we're going to join this fight again. Because I needed to replenish, man. I wrote the book in part of because I was full of rage and despair and disillusionment. And I tried, I was trying to, you know, given going back to your uh, debate with corn, I was trying to figure out how I was going to push this this boulder up this it's damn boulder. Up the hill. <laughs> <laughs> So here we go. We got to do it again, right? right? And it right. was in the context of, of of dealing with Jimmy's own despair and disillusionment after the assassination of Dr. King that I came to realize that it's it is in the pushing of the boulder that meaning is found. Yes, yes. Not in yes. the end itself. Yes. There's no guarantee. Right. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, and I know exactly what you're talking about. So again, we're on. Um, those of you who just joined in, we're on with Dr. Eddie Glaude. Um, who's uh, the author of this uh, instant bestseller, which I think still now is in the top five of the uh, of the bestseller list. Uh, we're excited. We, you know, we're about to show a video and take a hard turn, a little emotional turn, uh, as we've asked these final questions of Eddie Glaude. We also have a little time for questions. So if you um, have any questions, uh, please put it in the feed. Again, begin again. Uh, uh, get it will be given away a book, uh, 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 two books of his and two books of this one. So two books of each will, will we will be giving away today from now till noon. So we're going to show this quick video and I'm going to ask you a couple quick questions and with the audience in and we'll get you on audio, sir. Can I ask you a question? What the hell you got to ask me, Mr. Stewiggy, the one you got the questions for. How come you ain't never liked me? Like you? Who the hell said I got to like you? What law is there say I got to like you? Want to stand up in front of my face and ask a damn fool ass question like that? Talking about liking somebody. Come here, boy, when I talk to you. Straighten up, goddammit. I asked you a question. What law is there say I got to like you? None. All right, then. Don't you eat every day? Answer me when I talk to you. Don't you eat every day? Yeah. Nigga, as long as you're in my house, you put a sir on the end of it when you talk to me. Yes, sir. You eat every day. Yes, sir. Got a roof over your head. Yes, sir. Got clothes on your back. Yes, sir. Why you think that is? Because of you. <laughs> Hell, I know it's because of me, but why do you think that is? Because you like me? Like you. I go out of here every morning. I bust my butt putting up with them crackers every day because I like you. You're about the biggest fool I ever saw. It's my job. It's my responsibility. 
A man is supposed to take care of his family. You live in my house, fill your belly with my food, put your behind on my bed because you're my son. Not because I like you, because it's my duty to take care of you. I owe a responsibility to you. Now, let's get this straight right here now before I go along any further. I ain't got to like you. Mr. Rand don't give me my money. Come pay day because he like me. He give it to me because he owe me. Now, I don't give you everything I got to give you. I give you your life. Me and your mama worked that out. Between us and liking your black ass wasn't part of the bargain. Now, don't you go through life worrying about whether somebody like you or not. You best be making sure they're doing right by you. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, then get the hell out of my face and get on down to that A and P. So I want to take a different turn, Brother Eddie. Um, as we see in this filmic rendition, a rendition of um, the great August Wilson play Fences, the best of all works of art is the degree to which um, it elucidates the visceral, right? It sort of excavates and mines into the depths of who we are as a listener or as a participant. I'm thinking about your words in this book and your reference even in democracy and black and thinking about your relationship with your father and Baldwin's complicated relationship with his stepfather. And it moves me to sort of the mirror, right? Uh, uh, Little Wayne uh, uh, in, in that Bruno Mars song says, damn, I look like my effing dad, right? Mm. And so many black boys are starving for paternal validation and affirmation sort of overwhelmed with mama's love and trying to juxtapose that against if daddy loves me, how daddy loves me. Someone today on this show is listening or watching is going through their own complicated relationship with their father right now. My biological dad, uh, dad died of a drug overdose. My namesake, the Bailey stepdad of me, has spent decades working uh, with the Department of Corrections under the weight of the carceral state, still unsure about how to navigate through uh, life, especially with black life. So for me, reading this phenomenal text, it low key pushed me to the couch, man. Yeah. <laughs> it forced me to wrestle with how does America's anti-black hatred infect black men in such a way that our own ability to love, our own ability to love our own, maybe I should put it that way, right? Become sullied in the mess of America. Can you speak to me? Yeah. Can you speak to other dads? Can you speak to other sons navigating these complicated relationships the way that you and Langston do, right? Yeah, you know, if, if Langston could tell stories, cause you know, I couldn't get out from under it, you know? Mm. Um, and that, and it, you know watching that 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 footage was hard because it was so familiar but 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 i think you know my father i looked just like him um he scared me to death when i was growing up but you know he he delivered mail for a living and in mississippi heat and would use sweat out his belts literally rotten in the mouth he mm. fixed the same lunch every day a bologna sandwich with mayonnaise and mustard every single day we went to work realized he had precocious kids took a second job delivering flowers um when i didn't know how to do my times tables he hired my second grade third grade teacher down the street um having taken second job now hired to teach me my times tables but never used to say i love you right would we would exist in silence because when he said something, I would, I would freeze. My brother would scream at me, stop looking at him. He wants you to cry. And so writing this book, I barely survived because every time I got to the page, there was a glass of Jameson right next to me. Mm. Cause I was dealing with the fact that I was a vulnerable little boy trying to grapple with the scaffolding of lies that I have built in order to protect the fact that I am a vulnerable little boy. 
Now, what's so interesting about Jimmy and my life with my father is that Jimmy's judgment of his stepfather in the early work is much harsher than his judgment of his stepfather in the later work. He understands him. He understands the world in which he inhabited. He understood the difficulty, understood the difficulty that his stepfather faced. And it led to a heart, less harsh judgment about him and a harsher judgment about the world that impinged upon him. In my own journey with my own dad, right? I love him to death. And we had to get to that space. We have to work our way to that space. Um, but oh my God, what did it require? a kind of honesty, a kind of willingness to forgive, a kind of recognition that, you know, where how love is expressed is different, Yeah. right? But at the same time though, as painful as that, that moment is in the film and in the play, there's something right about it. And my daddy used to tell me this all the time. You don't need somebody to tell you you're worth something. Just look in the mirror. Mm. That's the only person you should trust to judge who you are. That's what he used to tell me. Mm. So when he says to his son, because in some ways, the father is jealous of the son in that in, in that play, of the opportunities. And people don't want to grapple with that. The opportunities that the son may have that he didn't have with regards right. to sport, right? But he tells him, don't go through life worrying about whether or not somebody likes you. Because my dad used to tell me all the time, I'm not here to be your friend. Mm -hmm. I'm here to prepare you for a world that's gonna do you in if you're not ready, mm -hmm. right? And so there were these moments of black love that were wounding and fortifying at the same time. Um, wow. All that's to say, though, is that I still ended up wounded. And like Doc says, man, you have to make a choice. And it's a choice that we all have to make because we're all wounded. Are you going to be a wounded healer or a wounded herder? Yeah. Which one? And if you choose the former, then you have to deal with your pain and make your way to, to being a different kind of human being in the world, if that makes sense, Doc. You hit me oh, with that one. I wasn't expecting this, man. I'm this sorry, early. man. I, but I mean, you took me there with this book, man. You took me there with it. And it just made me think about, again, obviously we all have roles in the academy, but we also have roles as men, right? And fathers and, and mentors. And I think I wanted to make sure that you uh, gave us word to that because you're tied into your book. So it's not yeah. You know, it's not as if I would say. I, the thing I would say too, Julius, I failed miserably when it came to raising my son. I thought I would leave all that stuff behind, right? If I could do it over again, my lord. But I thought I would leave it all. I thought I would leave all the stuff behind. You know, I'm a Princeton professor. That I, no, I come out of a working class Mississippi family on the right. coast, and that right. stuff is in me. That stuff, yeah, it's it's, it's in me, and so I don't want to pretend. Like I know, and it, I just know what I've been through. I know what yeah. I've seen. Um, and I know what has allowed me uh, to be able to, just yesterday, Doc, just yesterday my dad was saying to me, now I know you're speaking at all these corporations, but don't understand money ain't all that now. Don't mm -hmm. lose your voice. Don't mm -hmm. lose who you are. Said that to me yesterday in the video. Man, oh man. Your his mic is muted. Uh, yeah. So 
so yeah, so we're having a little technical difficulty at the, at the end of this interview. Uh, I think your mic is muted, brother, they said. That's what they said. Maybe uh, we'll see. Um, but I know you guys have been enjoying this, this conversation. Um, and um, we certainly want to tie this up as we uh, end uh, this show. Straighten No Chaser with uh, Dr. Julius Bailey. Um, we're just proud to have had Brother Eddie on. I don't know if he's going to come back here with his last question or not. Uh, his mic went muted at the end, right when he was telling us about his dad, man. And it's just, you know, I mean, Cisa, it's 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 a fundamental um, challenge that we have when we read books to sort of um, understand the author and he understand the influence of the author, mm -hmm. right? And that's why I wanted to obviously, you know. Uh, get to the text, but also get what's below the text, right. the subtext. And so, I mean, you've read through this. I mean, what were your thoughts about the book? Um, I appreciated the book, especially in the beginning. I think I read that chapter a couple times, The Lie. And that was going to be my question to Dr. Glaude. You know, um, what what does he feel is if, is one of the lies that we as a Black community have believed that has the capacity to hinder us and not allow us to move forward in all the objectives that we want to achieve. Right, right. No, no. I mean, I'm certain that he would have uh, had a great answer for you. Um, but, um, you know, we'll get him back. Um, we certainly appreciate you. Um, he is back. Oh, he is back. Sorry about that. Oh, that's all right, brother. Okay, we had a... Well, no, that's good. So so I don't know, man. I thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, so I think when we left off, you was just saying this yesterday, but I thank you for the story. Uh, I, I just kind of want to, I know you got a lot to do today, man. So I kind of want to uh, put on your uh, political hat real quickly. Uh, we know that um, this week Biden is going to choose a, a VP, right? And um, I wrestle with the importance of that in a typical election cycle, right? I'm not sure who Biden was for Obama. I'm not sure who Pence was to Trump, you know, but this season might be different, right? right? I mean, there might be a need for enthusiasm around old Joe. So um, I don't know. I mean, uh, do you have an idea? I mean, I think that Susan Rice would be a, a good pick. I think it'd be a, she's a firm and austere kind of uh, 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 choice. I think a Kamala certainly would get all the, AKAs involved across America, and that, and, and 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 that can't be bad. And uh, um, Stacey Abrams obviously is a solid candidate with huge political upside, right? And brings a sort of an organic energy around her. Um, my personal dark horse, which is unlikely, but is is Michelle Obama. You know what I'm saying? So, so I just need to know: Do you have an inside scoop that you can share with us on Straight No Chaser? I, or if I, you don't have the inside scoop. You know, sort of. Who do you think uh, uh, would be a good VP to I don't, go I, with? Uh, I don't. Jim? I actually don't know. Uh, to be honest with you, I know that he has to uh, navigate this this demand uh, uh, that he pick uh, a, a woman of color, a black woman particularly, uh, as his running mate. I'm I'm more interested. I'm less interested in identity, Julius, than I am in the actual content of policies people policy, uh, yeah. uh, bring forward. So. You know, I, I I don't know what Susan Rice brings to the table. I, we would have to, I would have to interrogate that a little bit more. Um, doubtful, uh, you know, in terms of uh, her role with regards to Iraq, her role right. uh, uh, in in the Clinton administration and the like. Uh, Kamala Harris, I love Kamala as a human being. Of course, I disagreed with how she uh, she executed her position as Attorney General in in California, uh, but I understand, you know, the push. I understand the push. We have to be clear as we uh, engage in this moment to understand what's the objective here, uh, to have a sister uh, as the VP. What do we want that to mean out beyond the symbolic significance of it? I think Biden should, in fact, choose a black woman, but we need to also ask these subsequent questions. Um, but my gut is telling me he's going to choose Gret, uh, Gut Governor Whitmer. Governor Whitmer out of Michigan. That's my yeah. gut. That's what my gut is telling me, and then some folks are going to have have to deal with them have to deal with something, right? Because uh, if he chooses a Whitmer, then we're going to have to ask ourselves some hard questions about where how do we move forward. 
No, that's real. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, brother, two qu questions from, from the audience, and we'll sure, get you out of here. Yes, sir. Go ahead, you can ask yours if you want to now. Oh, okay, perfect. So welcome it is back. Tisa. <laughs> welcome <laughs> back. Welcome back. So at, when you were muted, we were sharing that um, I read the chapter, a lot, The Lie, a couple times. Um, and as I read it, my question to you is, what do you feel is one of the lies that we as a Black community have believed regarding ourselves? The one that's most dangerous, at least in my mind, uh, is the way in which we we narrate the Black freedom struggle of the mid 20th century, that we allow uh, a story of Black power to be a story of decline, of declension, right? Even when we were burying our brother, John Lewis, Bill Clinton invoked that yeah. declension narrative. Yeah. We lost our way when we followed Stokely for two years, you know? Um, and this idea of separating the civil rights movement from the Black power movement um, has narrowed, in my view, the range of what constitutes legitimate forms of Black political dissent in this country. Um, and we tell a story that cuts off a whole host of, of political languages for us in this moment. Uh, so at the level of politics, I think the most dangerous thing that we tell ourselves, right, is that, you know, the civil rights movement, the Black freedom struggle is principally a movement uh, defined by uh, uh, the likes of Dr. King, when in fact it's much more complicated than that. Personally, um, it might very well be that the challenge for us um, involves this idea that, um, how, how can I put this and put it delicately? Well, I won't put it delicately. Sometimes we, we don't really believe what we say when we say all our skin folk ain't our kin folk. Mm. That, and so that leads to a kind of politics that that could be very, very dangerous for the most vulnerable in our communities, because you got some folk out here who just simply want to get a piece of the pie. They don't want to change uh, the basic structure of things and they can pimp in the name of blackness. Ooh. And that and that's a dangerous thing for the most vulnerable among us. No, that's true. Do we have any audience questions? Yes, we do. Mrs. Joelle Jones, she says, Dr. Glaude, this is great information, but how do we get this intellectual exercise into actual physical motion? Well, we have to organize. Um, one of the beautiful things about the current moment with regards to uh, the public lynching of George Floyd is that it revealed that organizers didn't stop doing their work after 2014. Right. Remember, we saw all of those young folk in the streets risking right. their lives, risking everything. Um, and then as soon as George Floyd popped off, what did we see? We saw a robust set of movements doing extraordinary yes. work. So this is not just simply spontaneous. This what we're experiencing now, the cry for defund the police wasn't just made up yesterday. Right. It's a reflection of an ongoing organizing effort around justice reinvestment. So. So part of the way in which we make this a reality is that we continue to organize. We continue to create space uh, for those on the ground to do their work, to fundamentally transform the circumstances, the material circumstances of everyday ordinary people at the local, state, and national level. Right, no, that's real. And so brother, we're gonna wrap up with this last question, man. Sure, Doc. Um, Trump has, um, you know, he appointed that new brother for the US Postal Service. And then the brother then went ahead and made some sweeping changes. And at the same time, he's having these conversations around the, the mail ain't going to work, voter fraud, all kind of stuff. Man, should we be worried? Oh, oh, hell yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Let me tell you why we should be worried. We should be worried for two reasons, if he wins or if he loses. This is going to be for the first time in my in my life that I actually have a fundamental question about the peaceful transition of power. Yes. If he loses, buckle up. If he wins, buckle up. Right. The legitimacy of the current election in November has already been called into question. Already. 38 to 40 percent of the country are diehard Trumpists. That means they have turned their backs on democracy. Clearly. And so we need to understand that, you know, as Baldwin put it in as much truth as we could bear in 1962, he says, uh, the trouble we, the trouble that we're experiencing is deeper than we think. And then he says, because the trouble is in us. Ooh. So yes, brother. Yeah. 
Brother, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a phenomenal 50-something minutes with uh, the great Dr. Eddie Glaude, Jr. He's, he's, he is a um, distinguished university professor at Princeton University, chair of African-American studies. Uh, he is the author of this current bestseller in America, Begin Again. Um, and Ms. Tisa will be picking some folk that will be giving this book away. We're giving two of these books away. Also, he, he gave me a shout out in this book, um, and I appreciate him where, uh, and so if you have this book, you already seen his shout out. Uh, but uh, of, of one of the things that you said, brother, and I appreciated it, was that after all the words you said, you, uh, you did say, whenever you read this, you said, I needed to read this book. And so I thank you for those words. And I thank you for your time today, sir. I appreciate you and everybody stay safe out there because you know the, the world is still a dangerous place with COVID-19. So stay safe. That is right. All right. So, so the listen straight, no chance that we just had the ability to uh, be on with Dr. Eddie Claude. And so, you know, that, that was good stuff, wasn't it? Very good. That was good stuff. So you all know, um, typically we have at this moment our, our drink to that segment. Uh, as I told you, since we came on a little early, we ain't going to drink too much to nothing this early in the morning. But we do have our Coca-Cola here. So let's just drink to Eddie, um, to this Begin Again book. And for all those who are engaged in one of the most uh, phenomenal writers of America in uh, James Baldwin. I think those of you who take part of the book and those of you who are where you are, uh, wherever you are, as Sister Joelle Jones said in her question, you all have to take the intellectual and translate it, that fuel into the practical. Join an organization, be a part of, of something. Don't just be out here sort of with your Twitter fingers, right? Uh, engage with people who are doing the work. And for all of you who are doing the work, I will drink to that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at Straight No Chaser, we ask you if you enjoyed today, which I know you did, please like it, please share it, uh, please tell a friend. We're also on um, Facebook um, and you can subscribe at, uh, at, at Dr. Julius Bailey there. Uh, this Wednesday, uh, we have an intellectual show. We got some powerhouse uh, professors also coming on Wednesday. We have a hodgepodge of conversations uh, that will come on this Wednesday. We're prepping for next week. We're gonna uh, have a phenomenal kind of closeout uh, we're going to take a break after the 19th. Uh, we have a special announcement on the 19th we're going to make on Straight No Chase. We're just excited that you've been with us now for six weeks and really have made this show a phenomenal show. I don't take you for granted. I don't take the dozens, of, the tens of thousands of you who have watched these shows. I don't take you for granted. Me and Ms. Tisa, we are grateful. Our, our, um, our engineer, he's grateful. And so as, as, as Dr. Glaud, I ask you to do, please be safe out there and take care, stay strong.